Welcome into the Atlanta Sports Party, your home for the best Atlanta sports talk. It's local insight you can't get anywhere but right here at Locked On. I'm your host, Tanitra Batiste. Alongside me is Jarvis Davis. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started. And of course, our Atlanta Sports Party is part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Now, coming up later, is it all or nothing for Braves country this season? And we'll talk about maybe being all nothing downtown at this point. But let's get the party started with our top takes on expectations out of Flowery Branch. Jarvis, the media had an opportunity to meet the three coordinators under Raheem Morris on Wednesday. Had an opportunity to hear from offensive coordinator Zach Robinson defensive coordinator Jimmy Lake, and special teams coordinator Marquise Williams. And when you think about some of the things that they said and kind of looking ahead to this upcoming season, who do you think has the opportunity to really have the biggest impact in year one under Coach Ra amongst these coordinators? It has to be Jimmy Lake for me because given what the defense was able to do just in one year under Ryan Nielsen, with bringing in people and, and spending money in free agency and drafting guys like Zach Harrison, who ended up coming on for you. Clark Phillips ended up shining a little bit throughout mm-hmm. the season as well. So some of those draft picks hitting in the first year, that's what you talk about when you talk about having an effect. Those go into the reasons why you say, hey, Ryan Nelson was really good in his first year. They kind of wanted to keep him around. But given coming into this year, you want to mm-hmm. try to do the same, right, as far as in the draft. Yes. You hope they bring in some young guys that can come in and have an effect right away. You look for mm-hmm. that year two bump like you've seen in, in, Jack, in Zach Harrison and Clark Phillips. And then you see guys like Arnold Ebiketi to continue yes. to evolve. They're going back to the 3-4 defense, which is what they spent two years under DPs, making sure they try to, you know, build that multiple 3-4 type defense out. And you only had one year where you were kind of transitioning or they said they, they act like they said they want to be multiple. But we know that they drafted saying, hey, we're going to transition to a 4-3. But so I feel like you got two years of guy of personnel that mm-hmm. you can go back to, which I feel like it'll be a smooth transition. And that's, that's why I feel like the weapons, that they have the guys that are there. You got Grady Jarrett coming back mm-hmm. off an of injury. You got David Onyemata who showed well in this first year with the team. So mm-hmm. I think there are a lot of key factors as far as a lot of questions already answered as far as sure. what that personnel is going to look like. You just want to be able to add to it. So I feel mm-hmm. like Jimmy Lake coming in, I feel like he has, he's the most set up for success, you know, yeah. when it comes to being in, in year one under Raheem Morris. Now, I think if you look at it from that angle of having the ability to have the biggest impact based on you're set up for it already. We'll talk a little bit about that. We'll go back to some of the reasons he set up in a moment. I would agree with you if that's the rationale, because I think that's a great angle and a great rationale, but I'm going to go with, and let me just say this about Marquise, because that's not my answer. It's actually okay. Zach Robinson. Okay. But let me just say this about Marquise. He would be like maybe the 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 one B for me because special teams did have an off year. Young Wei yeah, Ku was yeah. not his himself in terms of being him, as accurate. He hit as all his field goals, being, which right. is a very high standard. <laughs> yes, exactly. So yeah. that's the type of thing where you're like, if Ku misses anything, then it's an off. It's off. You know, it just it wasn't. And and more importantly we had gotten accustomed to seeing the Falcons flip the field and they just right. weren't able to do that. And granted, a lot of that had to do with Cordero Patterson not being there, but I'd love to see what a bounce back year looks like. And obviously Raheem Morris would love to see it as well because he decided to retain Marquise and of believes course. in the way that he approaches special teams. But for me, I think that the guy who has the opportunity to have the biggest impact is Zach Robinson because hell, what are you going but up? I mean, let's just be real. <laughs> Like that 19 easy, points, you can't go no, can't go nowhere yeah, well right. for 19 is, points a game, right? Right. There it is. There it is. You can, I mean, everywhere, Jarvis, can we break this down? We can go to red zone offense. Check. Oh, oh. So you can have the biggest impact. We can go to utilizing the weapons that you have in front of you. Kyle Pitts. Check. We can oh, go. Oh. Exactly. We can go into, oh my goodness gracious, you know, can you find a slot receiver that can actually give you something and tear things up in the middle and all over the place. But also, also, I love something that Zach Robinson said. As much as we put a lot of emphasis on 
the fact that you have a Bijan Robinson, a Tyler Algier, and possibly a Cordero Patterson, i.e. your running back room is tight. And right. you you know that you're going to go out and pursue the best quarterback possible. He was asked the question of, you know, how would he approach it? Would everything be about like kind of the run dictating the offense? And he said, no. He said, really, it's going to be about the team they play. It's the opponent, and they're going to scheme accordingly. I love that concept because yeah. I don't want them to always be so predictable. Now, granted, there were times where Arthur Smith had the opportunity to run the ball down a team's throat 11 times because it worked the 10 times before. Can't be right. mad at him for that, but right. let's be real. He also ran that ball a lot of the time, seven, eight, 10 times in a row because he had to. Yeah, and, 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 I, and I was just going to say, that I think that's the thing that, you know, you look for in, in offensive coordinators, right? Because there are certain things you can take out of the situation mm -hmm. because with Arthur Smith being the head coach as well, he got to think about both sides of the ball. Like, hey, I know there I might be able to take advantage of a soft secondary, yep. but if I'm throwing the ball more than I'm supposed to, I know more than likely it's going to get put in harm's way, given who's that quarterback. So, mm -hmm. and I don't want to put a defense that has been playing really well for me in a bad spot. So I think that, you know, that was perfect by Zach Robinson, but, but mm -hmm. here's why I didn't say Zach Robinson, because that 800 pound elephant in the room, that quarterback, oh my gosh, like all they need is a quarterback. Yeah. All they, all they need a lot is a of teams will say right. that. All yeah. they need is a quarterback. Yes, that that is a big freaking deal. So it is. That's the only reason why I didn't say Zach Robinson because I feel like there there are a lot of good options out there. Don't get me wrong; there are a lot of good options out mm -hmm. there. I feel it's just a matter of how they want to move and how they want to do it, right? right? But I just think that in that first year, it mm -hmm. has to be Jimmy Lake for me because, like I said, all they got to do is add a couple pieces as far as. There's no glaring need. Obviously, you know, edge rush is always going to be a need for me. Sure. But there's no glaring need. Like, oh, my gosh, if they don't get this, they're going to stink. And, you know, that's kind of what this offense is right now. Yeah, yeah. And I think – and and I understand it, and we got to move on. So I'll, mm. we'll just leave it right there. But yeah. I, I think that when we look at Zach Robinson, I do like the fact that he's talking about, you know, the same thing – consistently with what we heard from Raheem Robin Mars, where he talked about all options being on the table. Yeah. And, you know, he mentioned Taylor Heineke, he mentioned Desmond Ritter. Now, of course, you know, I think that was more just being respectable to the people in the room than anything, but yeah. he said this, he doesn't guarantee. I felt like he didn't make any guarantees that they won't be on this roster next year. Personally, I don't think they will be on the roster unless he finds something he sees like a little diamond in the rough, a little something he can work with with either one of them. Because to me, they're like the Spider-Man meme. They're the same person. But if he can find a little something, right, he can find a little <laughs> something between the two of them. He'll be like, I'll pick that Spider-Man, not that Spider-Man. And then that could be his backup. But I think right. other than that, at the end of the day, I also feel like without tipping his hand, he all they all but guaranteed that uh, those guys won't be on the roster. He didn't use the word elite processor exactly as Raheem Morris stated it, but he pretty much used the lead processor and what he's looking for because he had the template. He's already seen yeah. what greatness looks like. He saw Matthew Stafford. And even if it's not just outright Matthew Stafford, Hall of Fame type greatness, you kind of know what the blueprint looks like and what it is that you can work towards, whether it is a revitalization or a, an evolution of uh, Justin Fields or whether it's bringing in a rookie quarterback and not having him try to be the second coming of a C.J. Stroud, but more so being solid enough to get you where you need to be because to your earlier point, you've got enough in your defense and your special teams is going to bounce back to be able to give you a team that is pretty solid on all three in all three phases. And real quick, so I think that, you know, I think one of the decisions on, on decision on one of those guys is, is pretty much made, and it might be financial, right? Because yeah, if Taylor Heineke is cut, they could save seven million dollars against the cap. So right, like we talked about, where they go in those options, right? Like we know Kirk Cousins probably going to cost some, some nice change, mm -hmm. you know. So you might need or even Justin Fields, is or even Justin you. Fields. You know what I mean? Because you don't know you're going to keep some money in the coffers because you got yes. his. If you pick up the fifth year option, obviously you're going to do that. So you got yes. about two years left. And then, hey, we talking 35, 40 million dollars a year. That's what the going rate mm -hmm. is for starting quarterbacks in the NFL today. So yeah. I, I think that decision probably is already made. And I, but I'll be interested to see what they do with Desmond Ritter going forward.
Yeah, me too. Because then the, the flip side is how you know the Taylor Heineke at least gives you a slight edge of veteran presence, but I put emphasis on slight. It might not be worth the money to your point that you have to put out for him. And real quick, because I couldn't stop, I could not wrap this conversation up without at least going back to this because okay. it, I know it was exciting for me to hear, probably for you too as well, when Jimmy Lake confirmed that they'll primarily operate in the three four scheme. Now, of course, that doesn't mean we won't see hybrid looks. We know that, but that's sure. the base. And what it he said also was that there were three guys that you could really be multiple with a couple guys. You can put them right there at the line of sl- scrimmage, excuse me, and blitz off the edge. And it goes back to some of the guys that we were just talking about that showed flashes last year. And for different reasons, you know, maybe slow um, in the first half of the season, or maybe injured on the back half of the season, we didn't get to see all of it in its fullness. But I think that he definitely, Jimmy Lake feels like he has to your point, the personnel, maybe with the addition of an edge rusher, but the personnel is there in that linebacker core to be able to do the things that he wants to do, playing fast, playing physical, playing free, but also playing with varied variations of schemes and being able to pull it off successfully. And and, and that's the thing. That's kind of the beauty of switching between, you know, different, different uh, odd and even front, right? Because yeah. You had the first two years of, of the Arthur Smith regime was on the Dean Pease. Yep. He runs a multiple three, four type defense, right? Mm-hmm. So there was some 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 uh some skepticism because of Grady Jarrett obviously being a a, a natural three technique guy, mm-hmm. but he flourished that second year. Yes. And and, and, and Dean Pease's defense. So I, he had some some a very productive year mm-hmm. that year. So I I and then when you transition to Ryan Nielsen, you right. start to bring in some guys that can play in the even front. So mm-hmm. I think that combination of 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 still running the multiple because it's hard to transition right. straight to a, a, yeah. an even front right in mm-hmm. one year. So being that they went fully in trans had full, hadn't fully transitioned to an even front, mm-hmm. I feel like the, the best route to go was to go back to the base three four. And yeah. I think you you definitely got the personnel already on the on the roster. All you gotta do is just add to it, like mm-hmm. you know. As many dog on edge rushes as you possibly get. Yeah. Draft all of them. All like if you want to. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> That's this, what I'm at, yeah. The sports party will have a party if you do that. We will. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Never absolutely. will you hear uh, a big a, party. A ill world. Yeah. Never will you hear an ill word from us if you decide to do that. Listen, when we come back, we're going to deep dive into a situation that is whew, certainly feels like it's much more dire in downtown than it is in Flowery Branch. We'll talk about it on the other side. This episode of our Atlanta Sports Party is brought to you by FanDuel. Get buckets with your first bet on FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 if your bet wins. Bet on all your favorite NBA players and teams with quick bets, live same game parlays, exclusive props. And think about this. Think about this. You've got All-Star Weekend coming up. You've got a couple of things that are new where you have... Steph Curry going up against Sabrina Ionescu, Ionescu, and that's new. It's a three-point challenge. You might want to get into it. Also, of course, Trey Young will be participating in three events. He'll be participating in the three-point contest, the skills challenge, and, of course, the all-star game itself. So there could be some pretty cool quick bets out there, some live same game parlays, probably trying to figure out if anyone's going to eclipse, I don't know, the 175 point or 200 point mark at the way these NBA teams are going these days. And of course the exclusive props and so much more. So don't forget to visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and shoot your shot. FanDuel official sports book partner of the NBA. So Jarvis, we just had a happy conversation. You know, we started the party off the way it should be because <laughs> I feel like it's still happy times and party days and flowery branch from what we're hearing in these first returns from the coordinators and rounding out Raheem Morris, the staff, mm-hmm. which I could tell you the same was coming from downtown. Not, not. <laughs> yeah. Still angry from last night. Sure. Yes. am. Uh huh. Still angry. I am too. As my, yeah. As my boy, Deshaun Tate put it in our locked on Hawks postcast, the birds got, got by the bees. And it was just, it was, I know it's corny, but it was true. It was corny, but it was true. And it's really one of those situations where Jarvis, it was, we use every cliche that is out right now. 
The math ain't math. It. Make it make sense. Nah, bruh. Bro, what's going on? I mean, we literally went down the rabbit hole. It was so oh bad, God. Jarvis. It was so bad. And then uh, to follow up on that, just if you guys know Jarvis and I, then you know that we are super cool and bosom buddies with our guys, Andy Bucker and Randy McMichael. And uh, they literally said, we'd like to extend our condolences to you, Tanitra, to have to cover the Hawks this year. That's where we are. That's wow. that's how middling and frustrating a situation yes. we find ourselves in yet again. Because Jarvis, get this. Not only are we at a point where the Hawks are heading into this all-star break, seven games under 500, having lost to a team that had only beaten 12 other teams this 12. year, or 11 teams because they beat you once before, so there's that yeah, back yeah. in October. Ooh. But, yeah, literally we're going into that. And this is – get this. This is the worst record the Hawks are taking into the all-star break in the last five seasons. Last five seasons. That's where we are. We're not even middling anymore, Jarvis. That's how bad it is. And so at this point, there's a lot of conversation, a lot of speculation, a lot of commentary on where in the world do these Hawks go next? Because, of course, we're now also beyond the trade deadline. So there was an article that talked about being bored by the NBA trade deadline because, you know, maybe not a lot happened for your particular team. The Hawks in particular, we know didn't make any moves and some of the bigger moves like Pascal Siakam, which he was one of the guys that everybody was gunning for ends up with the Pacers and um, not really a lot of exciting moves from there. Right. Well, mm -hmm. enter the chat, Trey Young. And it's right now you got multiple conversations. <laughs> Boy, I hate that term, but anyway, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you got that. Uh, you, you, but that that's what's happening right now. Like, yeah. Yep. One of the more recent ones, and I wanted to add to that as well, something I heard just this morning, one was it's more likely the, that the Lakers will be the ones maybe pursuing that younger star to complement LeBron James and Anthony Davis. Might that be Atlanta's Trey Young? Now, a couple of Eastern Conference execs are saying, hey, he might be available. A Western Conference exec even said, I think they would love to trade Trey, meaning the Hawks. And at this point, I kind of likened it to this, Jarvis, and, and I'm going to mm -hmm. kind of fall back and hear from what you have to say. Oh, let me just add the other team, and then I want to hear what you have to say. But at this point, I feel like there's no middle ground, right? You're either going to, like, crap the bed and just go on and tank your little self out and rebuild, or you're going to go all guns blazing and try to ascend to the top of the Eastern Conference. I don't think there's any middle ground anymore. I mean, you've been middling for quite some time now. Now, there was some speculation out there, even this morning, that maybe the Spurs are interested in pairing Trey Young with Victor Wimanyama, but that's probably the one that has the least traction because word is that that wouldn't be a good fit for, okay, well, let's just be real, Greg Popovich. Just in no, terms of, yeah, how he likes to approach his game and the, the players that work for him in, in his system. But Jarvis, at this point, where are you? I mean, do yeah. you think the Hawks should trade him? Why would the Hawks love to trade Trey Young? I mean, where are you, Where, given where we are now? For me, the, the number one question that needs to be answered when it comes to this team, how can you get better? And when it comes to... Or can to, you get Or can better. you get better? I feel you can. Here's how. This may sound crazy. People might look at me and say, Jarvis, you don't know what the hell you're talking about. Or you, you should stop doing sports. I'm not going to stop doing sports, first of all. And secondly, this is how they get better. They might have to just trade Trey. Because here's the thing. You got a point guard right here in DeJounte Murray. And... He's not that valuable on the market, given what you traded for him already, because you already made a mistake by giving up three first round picks for him. Now, granted, I know he was an all defensive guy and all that stuff, but it just that was that that was a lot. That was a yeah. lot, and and now you don't have you can't think about um, tanking because shoot, the dog on San Antonio are gonna reap the benefit of that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, in twenty twenty five, starting in twenty twenty five, they're gonna reap the benefit of that. So. You can't go that route. So here's the thing. Who has the most value on your team right now? People just starting to realize that Trey Young is a really good basketball player. Oh, he actually tries on defense now. Oh, we might be able to work with that. Yeah. Okay. Boston. 
Um, y'all got two superstars. Y'all got two guys that play the same position. How about we give you Trey? You give us Jalen Brown. We pair Jalen Brown with DeJounte Murray. That that backcourt a little bit different. That wing per spot is a little bit different now. You, now we're talking about, okay, we can have some serious conversations about getting better. I, that's the only route that I see the Hawks getting better is think about Trey, Trey Young. See what's out there. And I, and I, and I really, really like Trey. I love yeah. Trey. Yeah. I love what right. I love his growth and everything, what he's been able to do since he's been here. Mm-hmm. But if we're talking about answering that number one question, how yeah. do you get better? It doesn't, you can't get better by trading to Jante Murray. All that is, you may, may might be able to get a first round pick. Yeah. Is that going to get you better? Mm, probably not. Probably not. Not in the immediate. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Not in the immediate. So I think that if you're trying to immediately win games and you say, you know what? What will you be willing to offer? <laughs> you know, Landry Fields, because Landry Fields, it's time for him to put his stamp on his team. I've been saying this, like all this stuff is, that's that's going on with the team right now, Travis Slank did it. Right or wrong. You know, Jalen Johnson, that was a right. <laughs> he he got that one right for yeah, sure. You, yeah, I'll give you Onyeko Kongu as well. Well, absolutely. I, I definitely yeah, give him that. that. Absolutely. Yeah. But Onyeka and Kongu ain't got no no real value Not that can get no. you better. No. So hey, you develop, keep them, you know, develop them in your system and, and get mm-hmm. them right. Like so for me, I just feel like if I hate to, I hate to have to go that route. But mm-hmm. if the Hawks want to get better, if that is the number one goal, just to get better, right? They have to seriously consider I'm um, train train. But I think that's the question: Do they yeah. really want to? Because Ooh. right, Ooh, I think it is. Ooh. Yeah, Ooh, yeah. You yeah. want to some? Oh, I'm yeah. with you. I'm with you. I'm. Totally I'm, not sure. with you right. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not sure because remember, last week's statement was the R word resulting oh gosh they said they weren't focused on resulting i looked up what? the definition what? of resulting what does that mean? exactly what does that mean? please help me yeah, out yeah occurring <laughs> or following as the consequence of something that's the definition of resulting like literally talking of a general election and the resulting political uncertainty meaning you do something and then there should be an occurrence or something that happens he said they're not focused on resulting. They're fo- really focused on developing. So that's why I say it not to be Ooh. disrespectful and not Ooh. to be rude or, or anything. I am simply saying by definition of resulting, you're saying that's not what you're necessarily going for and that people get too bogged down in it. Well, then that tells me that that's yeah. not the focus. And that's why I said, I think it's trending more towards a rebuild because mm-hmm. if you're not resulting, then that means you're not trending in the direction of trying to catch the Celtics or you're not trending in the direction of trying to catch um, uh, the Bucks, Bucks yeah. or, mm-hmm. or the Sixers when Joel Embiid is in the lineup, basically your top tier teams and the heat when they go, you know, on their deeper season. Yeah, they're going to go on the run. On the exactly. half that's why, run. exactly. That's why I always yeah. have to put them up there. I'm like, what they, what they look like today, people. <laughs> Don't even pay attention to it. Yeah. yeah. But that's why I question it because that statement spoke volumes. And again, you and I were never of the mindset that DeJounte Murray should just be tossed out there just because. So you could say, hey, we made a trade. We did something. But Jarvis, mm. Here's what last night did. And before we wrap up, you and I just got to talk about this real quick. Last Mm -hmm. night was another great example of how resulting can't, you're right, resulting is not the focus. The focus must be development of some sort because resulting, if you thought about it, it would have said to you, I have to go get somebody. Like it may be a third stringer. And we know we don't really talk in strings in, in, in basketball, but hear me out here. It may be, here's Clint slash here's Onyeka. But it's got to darn sure be somebody between Onyeka and Bruno, because because that ain't that ain't that ain't it. And so knowing oh that Clint God. Capella was already injured and injury prone, yeah. Knowing that you took an L on Jalen Johnson for five weeks, who would be like your emergency center, if you will. Right. That means all you can rely on is Onyeka. You were stacked in your backcourt. You have Kobe Bufkin and the Matthews boys and all of those other. You've got us stacked enough so that if Trey goes down, you got Bogey. You know, even though I know Kobe's young with it, but I'm just saying, like you, your backcourt is. Stacked. You have a body. 
Or you got bodies there. It is. You potential. got bodies you know what with I'm saying? potential. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. But what do you have in case your front goes down? Lo and behold, your front court went down. Clint Capella is returning to practice when All Star break wraps up. They didn't say games. They said returning to practice. Onyeka Okongwu was called out on Tuesday after the MRI results to be evaluated in seven to 10 days. So you won't even be evaluated until the 20th or somewhere between the 20th and the 23rd, which means that you're probably not coming back in the month of February. That's where yeah. we are, Jarvis. I just had to yeah. put that out there just in terms of asking the bigger question of what is it that you're really ga gaming for? Because now you find yourself in a situation and it played out last night, although it was really the backcourt of the Hornets that smoked the hell out of the Hawks. Mm -hmm. Ultimately speaking, there were so many moments in that game where it was clear that you are suffering now that you don't have a lot of front court support. Yeah, because that Bruno Fernando situation last night was oh, an atrocity. God. It was trash. Yeah. That was awful. Like, they're trying to take advantage of a weakness, obviously, with the Charlotte Hornets down low. Obviously, there was a weakness there, but oh my God, they used Bruno Fernando. It didn't even matter. To try to do it, like, like, yeah. uh, just an entry pass. T, you couldn't even. Yeah, it was. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, no, so, bro, yeah, that's no. all on you, man. That's, that's, yeah, yeah. There, that's yep. <laughs> there, no, there it is. Exactly. Right, yeah. And <laughs> but we we talk about no, no, exactly. But you're absolutely right. It stops the buck stops at the front office, and the buck stops at the ownership. I, I know that they don't necessarily want to put that money out there like that. But Jarvis, it's like you said, if winning is really the goal or resulting is the goal in some way, shape, or form then there have to ha maybe have to be some resets in the, the approach. Anyway, when we come back, we're going to talk about another reset, a shocking reset of an approach that we've been actually talking about on a number of our shows the last few weeks, and it's now touched down right here in our backyard. We're going to talk about it in the Around the Metro coming up next. What's going on, good people? Jarvis Davis here for Subtext. Join subtext.com slash locked on sports Atlanta is the website you need to go to. Guess what, guys? We got some really exclusive stuff. Become a locked on sports Atlanta insider. I'm talking about video game, not video game breakdowns, video game breakdowns, game breakdowns, game film breakdowns, breakdowns of players as we're getting ready to hit the uh, combine is coming up, guys. I'm going to be dropping some stuff on there for you. So all you got to do is go to joinsubtext.com slash Locked On Sports Atlanta, and you become a Locked On Sports Atlanta insider today. Jarvis, you want to talk about dropping some knowledge? Woo! We got a bombshell earlier today in Atlanta Metro. South Carolina is hiring Georgia State head coach Sean Elliott as its tight ends coach. And it's very interesting. And also, um, he'll be doing some work with them as far as like game coordination as well. Now, mm -hmm. what makes it interesting is this. Two days ago, Georgia State just took the practice field for spring practice. I remember. And he was so excited and talking yeah. about how cool it is to be back on the field and seeing all the new faces and the opportunity to develop them. And you're thinking to yourself, okay, going seven seasons with Georgia State, five bowl games. Four wins, including a win last to wrap up last season. Okay, okay, they're building something downtown. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, exit stage left. Brother is going up to South Carolina to rejoin the Gamecocks program. Of course, he'd been with that program from 2010 to 2016, serving in a number of capacities. O-line coach was the last role he was in, but also it served for a stint as interim head coach. So obviously going back to a place where he has ties. But Jarvis, mm -hmm. the bigger issue is this. We've been talking about the wild, wild west as it relates to NIL, the transfer portal, uh, recruitment and retention and recruitment and recruitment and recruitment again, and mm -hmm. how much pressure is bearing down on these head coaches in this space to get this done. I don't know about you, Jarvis, but is this enough? I feel like it is. You feel like this is another casualty of that situation where a coach is just saying, you know what? I'll just tap out. I can go over here and I can be an assistant coach and I can have so much, so many more resources and still do the thing I enjoy without having to deal with the headaches that are coming with all of the rest of this ancillary stuff. I read the uh, a quote from uh, the man himself, Sean Elliott. As hard as this decision is professionally, it's something that I must do personally. Yes. That explains it all. 
there. That explains it all. The recruitment of 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 the recruitment. That is going That's it. on. Today. I mean, oh, oops. Oh, oh, Laura, sorry. I'm going to have to edit that out. Hey, Tanitra, sorry. Sorry, T. As I always <laughs> tell you, you better call me today. You better never call her me. So I, you can call me that all day long, sis. All day long for my sis. No problem. Yeah, no problem. So for those who don't know, my wife is named today. Yes, so exactly. yeah. Sorry, and we're y'all. actually Tanitra, first cousins today, in our mind. Yes. And, and we're actually like the same person in so many yes, ways. But no I always doubt, tell him, no I'm going to stand behind in her shadow when it comes to calling a wrong name with no problem. But yes, uh, not that if I embarrass myself. Back no, no, but, you know, wait, but wait, can I wait? Can I just defend my brother? His course, wife has been an amazing, amazing professional at Georgia State for many, many years. So just so you yes. guys know, he was stream of consciousness. Continue, my brother. Absolutely. So yeah, so Sean Elliott, I think that that, that quote just speaks to a, a, a lifestyle, right? Because yes. you, you're willing to put up with certain things. Sure. You understand, like, okay, the transfer portal gonna be a little different, but oh man, now these cats can go out every year. They get one free transfer, and uh, now they want uh, NIL deals. And shoot, I'm at Georgia State. What you mean a collective? <laughs> I, I haven't heard of any. I don't know if you heard any. No, you not know at what I'm all. Saying? So you know these cats coming in with. You know, demands and yep. oh, it is now. Granted, I I love these cats. Got some leverage, you know, when, sure. got, when it comes to negotiating and all that stuff and going mm-hmm. with play ball and all that stuff. Yes. I get it, but oh my gosh, I just I feel sorry for these coaches. They get paid some money, but he ain't getting paid uh, uh, enough money like that. to put up with this stuff. Like now, if he Kirby, you can pay ten, eleven, twelve million dollars right. a year. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, I might be able to put up with this headache. You know, right. what and I'm then saying? you also have okay with that, right? And, and if you're Kirby Smart. You also have a juggernaut of a program. Like you literally got a machine. Yeah. yeah, Because as we were hearing the news on Wednesday about him losing or his special teams coordinator moving on, I mean, Jarvis, in the Mm -hmm. same breath that Scott Cocker was out of there, they already had not just his replacement, but a whole tiered game plan of how everything was going to play out. They're not going to skip a beat. And so when you look in the recruiting space, yes, you're going to see Kirby pop up as certain things himself. Yes, you're going to see him do some hands-on stuff himself, but there are also going to be a gauntlet of people right there with him to help him through that process. That is not the type of resource that a Sean Elliott would have at a Georgia State. Why not? Why not go down the street and say, you know what, Shane Beamer? You do. You do all of that. I can help you out. I can help help you. you I'm happy to help you. But you you go do all that. Exactly. So, no, I mean, I can't. It was a shock to us because Sean Elliott is, you know, even as media professionals, there are certain coaches that really give us so much love and so much respect and allow us to kind of come in their space to do our jobs. And he's one of them, always willing to allow the media to come into the space and be a part of that Panthers program growing. So we'll miss him in that regard. But Jarvis, nothing but much love and respect for the decision that he had to make. And speaking of love and respect, oh, ho, ho, Braves country, it's time. Pitchers and catchers yes. have reported to North Point, Florida for spring training. And not just pitchers and catchers, but as per the Braves usual, other guys have already shown up to start working out. Michael Harris the second, Austin Riley, newly minted Brave, Jared Kelnick. So you already got those guys raring to go. And not just showing up, but ready to show out. As A.J. Minter said it, he said, quote, yeah, it's World Series or bust. Like, that's where we are. And you know what, Jarvis? Is it? For me, it is. It has to be. It has yeah. to be because when you think about – and it's it's going to make the regular season a little bit – it's going to lessen a little bit, you know what I'm yeah. saying? Because they had yeah. such a great regular season last yeah. year. And you're almost at the point where you said, all right, don't be so good during the regular season. Then just pick it up toward the end of the year and then just take it into the playoffs. And plus – can we not lose to the Phil- the Philadelphia Phillies again? Like, I don't want to yeah. see that. I, no, I at promise all. You, I don't yeah. want to see it. I'm tired of it. I hate yeah. the Phillies. I've always had Darren Dalton, Larry, Lenny Dykstra, you know, all of them. All of John Crook. I, I just can't stand them. So, yeah, we can't lose to a team that we spanked during the regular season yeah. and then come in, come in in the postseason and we, we get, get our butts kicked up out of, out of there. I can't do that. I can't, I can't stand to do that. So, yeah. yeah. I'm with AJ. World Same. Series of bus. Let's make this regular season exciting. Get another divisional um uh uh, uh flag and put on around the stadium. Mm-hmm. And let's do something in the playoffs, man. Let's just yeah. get there. Once we yeah. get there, 
we'll be cool. We'll figure exactly. it out. Yeah, you'll figure it out. Yeah, get to the postseason and do whatever you can to I look. I don't, I don't even want you having to go to the Phillies if at all possible. Like, go around them because it seems like you got everybody else in check and you're good. I'm, a, I'm with you on that because yeah. I said it like, oh, yeah, yeah. I want to play the Phillies. No, nope. I said it too. I was like, oh, yeah, now we got you. We got, no, sir. No. <laughs> stay wherever you are. In stay the over city. there. Yeah, stay, stay, right, stay over there. Over there. <laughs> go, yeah, stay over there. No, it's good. But I like it. I like the moxie of him. And it goes back to something Michael Harris II said as they started spring training as well. We're, we're the culture. Like we're very much our city. We're bold. We're mm-hmm. we have we have fun, and we can do things with excellence while having a good time. And we don't back down. We embrace who we are. So I'm good mm-hmm. with AJ Minter coming out and saying what he's saying because I feel like that tells me there's no hangover in what happened last season to them. They've shaken it off. They understand. Hey, yeah, it hurt. It sucked, but we we got to be on mission. And I love it. And I'm all here for it. And I think so is all of Braves country. We appreciate you guys for stopping by the sports party. It is, of course, on our YouTube channel, streaming live 24-7, all things Atlanta sports 24-7. And remember to like and subscribe to that YouTube channel as well. We are also free and available wherever you download your podcasts. We will see you on the Atlanta football party on Monday.